Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. And today's episode, we're coming back to Edgar Cayce. We've now explored Edgar Cayce in a few different ways in regards to his interpretation of the Book of Revelation. And we've gone over some of those different channelings. We've also discussed the mind is the builder, the idea of how we create reality. Uh, There's so much in the Edgar Cayce material that I really would love to talk about. One thing he has is a discussion of Egypt. There's a book you can find called Edgar Cayce's Egypt that it goes over the Rata and we've got to read it sometime. It's just gigantic. If you don't know about Edgar Cayce, he was considered the dreaming prophet and was a profound and devout Christian who would go into these deep trances in a sleep state and he would help people out. He'd help them out in diagnosing diseases and he would access the Akashic record. And a lot of the stuff that he talked about was true. And we continue to find information here that's powerful. So today I wanted to do a deep dive on his discussion of intuition and the channel of your guardian angel. In one session, Edgar Cayce says, the divine is within self. Hear the voice within, not the tempter from without. In another session, he says, thy body is indeed the temple of the living God. There he has promised to meet thee, to commune with thee. There is the psychic development, the psychic phenomenon that ye seek, Edgar Cayce. And even another session, he says, the intuitive forces that arise with same make for rather the safer, the saner, the more spiritual way with the less aptitude of turning to forces from without. Hence, intuitive force is the better, for in this there may come more union of the spirit of truth with creative energy. Thus, the answer may be shown thee in whatever manner or form. There are many channels and many manners. Edgar Cayce 261. So the question is, have you ever had the experience where you just knew something about a person the moment you met? There are some people you instinctively trust and others you distrust. Did someone ever say to you, trust me, and you had a gut reaction that you shouldn't? Have you ever trusted such a person and later regretted it? Sometimes we have feelings about a situation that we just can't explain. Maybe you're shopping for a used car. You find one you really like and the price is right, yet you have this unexplainable feeling. No, don't buy it. There's something wrong here. Have you ever ignored such a feeling and later wished you hadn't? These feelings are like hunches. I haven't met a person who hasn't had a hunch yet. Neither have I met anyone who doesn't have a sad or even tragic story to tell about ignoring one. Hunches are often right even if they don't often make sense. Sometimes we just have a feeling about something that we can't explain on the basis of anything we've learned. The knowledge just seems to come from the inside. Strange as it may seem, the knowledge is usually accurate. And what I'm talking about is intuition, of course. We often define it as knowing without the use of the senses or reason. In other reasons, it's direct knowing knowledge comes your way asking you to accept it even if you can't explain it the intuition is a common everyday word yet it hides a mystery intuition has always challenged thinkers it suggests a reality that has somehow different or hidden from what appears obvious to the senses or reason your own intuitions may have made you wonder how you can know things that you have no apparent basis for knowing Perhaps your intuition can also help you understand Casey's view that human being is naturally a channel. Some of our exploration of channeling will challenge your reasoning mind. No matter how hard I can explain things in a clear and reasonable fashion, you'll still need your intuition to see what reason can't grasp. Intuition as a channel of guidance. Intuition is a channel of knowledge that comes through you from a seemingly invisible and unknown source. You may experience it as a gut reaction or you may feel it in your bones. An intuition may give you a nudge to do or not to do something. It may give you a feeling about something, an inclination or an inspiration. 
Intuition is a natural channel of guidance. One use of intuition that I value is my inner defensive driving program. Sometimes you might find yourself pausing when entering an intersection only to see a car running a stop sign and crossing your path. I regularly get hunches about intersections and specific cars that I should watch carefully. Sometimes I intuit that a particular car may suddenly turn in front of me or do something else that might affect me. These hunches are usually right. I also find intuition to be a reliable channel of guidance in my business affairs. On certain days, for example, I'll feel an urgency to discuss a proposition with a member of one of the organizations for whom I do consulting work, yet I'll have a hunch that I better not. If I ignore the hunch and proceed anyway, things don't work out. Then a day will come when I'll get a feeling to act now. The feeling usually proves valid. Sometimes I will have nothing particular in mind when I'll get the urge to visit a particular organization. I'll arrive and run into someone who'll say, what a coincidence, I was just thinking about you. The person has a project to discuss, and my being on the scene at this time makes me a ready consultant. I'm certainly not the only one who finds intuition helpful in business. Years ago, Douglas Dean and his associates at the New Jersey School of Engineering published Executive ESP. Their research demonstrated that the corporations that were doing the best economically had leaders who scored high in ESP tests. These corporate executives were even quite willing to express a belief in ESP and they admitted relying heavily on their intuitions in making decisions. Judging today from the number of books on intuition in the business section of the bookstore, there's a bull market for learning to use intuition. The Psychic Side of Intuition Edgar Cayce called intuition the highest form of psychic ability. He paid it with this compliment because intuition never comes randomly with odd bits of information. Intuitive information is never simply idle gossip about something of no concern to you. Intuitive knowledge comes to you because the information is useful for you at that moment. Intuition is also more than psychic ability. It draws a conclusion and directs your actions. It's holistic. Casey explained that intuition compares psychically obtained information with your ideals, your needs, and your purposes, and then searches for an appropriate response. Intuition works like a faithful guide dog's nose. It can sniff out situations, locate quarry, or alert you to danger. In her well-researched and documented book, Sidetrack, sociologist Lael Bartlett gives a number of examples of how intuition has saved lives. She tells the story of, for example, a 19-year-old girl, Elaine, getting ready to board a bus for an important trip. Suddenly, Elaine had an overwhelming urge to visit her mother instead. She switched buses and headed in the opposite direction, toward her parents' furniture store. All the way on the trip, she found herself anxious to get there. When she arrived, she found her parents sitting in some chairs near the store's front window. She felt silly about her bizarre feelings of apprehension. Yet she managed to convince her surprised parents through the back of the store. A car crashed through the front window, demolishing the chairs where her parents had been sitting. Perhaps you have heard a story similar to this one. There are many such stories of trips postponed or canceled on the basis of foreboding feelings. But for no other apparent reason, that is no reason was visible until later. This type of incident happens often. An interesting study, in fact, suggests there's an uncanny, intuitive wisdom at work in the traveling population. W.E. Cox studied train accidents. He compared the number of people on trains on the day of an accident with the number of passengers on other days. Sometimes these differences were very pronounced. The Georgian, for example, had only nine people aboard for its accident on June 15, 1952, Yet the day before it had 68 passengers, and the day before that 60. Each day that week, except the day of the accident, it carried an average of 60 passengers. The day of the week the accident occurred was not usually one with few passengers. On the same day of the four preceding weeks, there were 35, 55, 53, and 54 passengers. The overall statistics confirmed his hunch that wrecked trains carried significantly fewer passengers than trains that had a normal trip. People have some intuitive way of avoiding accidents. Cox termed the source of this effect subliminal premonition. 
It suggests that intuition often guides our actions without knowing it. Intuition then operates through a subliminal channel of guidance. However, we wish to define or explain intuition, its invisible hand does seem to guide our actions. We can be thankful for it, even if we don't understand it. Edgar Casey provides a way, however, to understand intuition so we can cultivate this everyday channel of guidance to our advantage. His approach also gives intuition a higher purpose in our lives to help us realize something even more important. All knowledge is within. Casey valued intuition as a channel of both guidance and inspiration. He also valued it because it operated in a purposeful manner consistent with a person's values. Most of all, he valued it because using intuition directs our attention within ourselves. Casey defined the intuition as knowing from within. Learning intuition required turning within, looking within, and sensing information that came from within oneself. Knowing that all knowledge is within us and learning to look within were the two keystones of Casey's teachings. Understanding and developing intuition puts us on the path to those important lessons. Perhaps you already have an intuitive grasp of what makes intuition possible. My first experience with an intuitive understanding of intuition came from the book Zen in the Art of Archery by Eugen Herigl. The author, a German philosopher, traveled to Japan to learn about Zen. The Zen masters wanted nothing to do with him, assuming his interest to be an intellectual one only. By consistently demonstrating his personal sincerity, however, he finally was able to begin instruction under Master Kenzo Awa, the revered archer. For four years, Herigl found himself engrossed in the challenge of learning how to draw the long and very stiff Japanese bow. How to release the arrow smoothly was even more difficult, like learning ballet. Zen archery required both extreme physical effort and learning how to move gracefully through unfamiliar and awkward gestures. It required learning the mysterious secret of getting out of his own way and letting the movements flow. There was also the matter of disciplining his breath. He also was learning that Zen archery is a form of meditation. During this time, he shot at no target. The target he learned was an inward one, a state of mind. Learning to draw and release the arrow properly required disciplining and developing this state of mind. It was truly a spiritual discipline. During, finally, the fifth year, the master brought out a target and demonstrated shooting at it. Herigl saw that his master could repeatedly hit the center of the target without apparently aiming the bow. He watched closely and confirmed his master's eyes were barely open and that he did not take aim. He joked that his master had learned to shoot in his sleep. Herigl's remark resulted in an invitation to return the master's studio that night. The master then revealed an amazing secret about the Zen art of archery in pitch blackness. The master quickly loosened an arrow and then another at the target some 60 feet away. When Herigl found his way to the target, he discovered that the first arrow had hit the center. The second arrow had penetrated and split the first. Herigl wondered how a person could hit the target without being able to see it. If the first arrow was some combination of luck and experience, what about the second arrow? The master explained that he believed we need our eyes to see because we believe the world is out there beyond us. If you separate yourself from the target, you then have to learn the trick of how to hit it with the arrow. He advised that the art is to become one with the target, allowing the arrow to return to its natural home. He said that an archer who aims the arrow at the target is merely a trick shooter. The archer who becomes the target is on the path to realizing the Zen's great secret. The year spent practicing drawing and releasing the arrow was to learn how to let it shoot. The archer becomes merely a channel for the art of archery to manifest the spirit of Zen. Like the Zen archer, Casey knew how to hit the bullseye by turning within himself to contact the source of all knowledge. Like the Zen master who taught Herigl, Casey teaches us how to turn within to hit the targets in our lives. Like Herigl, we learn from Casey to shun trick shooting. In contrast to the archer's use of concepts from Zen Buddhism, Casey's teachings draw upon biblical concepts. He reminded us of Jesus 
teaching that the kingdom of God is within. If God is within, then everything is within. Casey's advice was to follow the principle given in the Bible to seek first the kingdom within. Everything else will be naturally forthcoming. Concerning the workings of intuition, Casey approached it like the Zen master approached archery. He didn't practice it to become a good shot. He practiced it as a way to truth. Don't develop intuition to provide a good performance, such as becoming psychic. Follow the path of intuition because it leads to our true nature. One with God. To Casey, this discovery, like Zen's great secret, is the true prize and main value of developing intuition. The secret of unitary oneness. Casey's perspective on intuition also provides a vision of how intuition operates and what makes it possible. Intuition is not a creation of the conscious mind. The conscious mind separates us from the rest of life so that we can analyze it with our senses. The conscious mind which reasons on the basis of the senses assumes knowledge must come from without. Such an assumption is self-evident to the conscious mind. Intuition, however, operates on another assumption. Intuition presupposes an underlying unity to all life. Until restricted to a mystic's awareness, science is coming to adopt a similar point of view. Science is the ultimate expression of the viewpoint of the conscious mind, using its intellect to perfect a method of knowing. Using its own favorite methods, however, science has discovered their fundamental limitations. Browse the New Age section of your local bookstore and you'll find a variety of recent books on the emerging new science, such books as Sympathetic Vibrations, The Tao of Physics, and the dancing Wu Wei masters all explain how modern scientific concepts are approaching a worldview similar to mysticism. Here is a nutshell version of the story of the new science. We traditionally assume that separate atoms with space in between them make up the world. We assume that it requires a chain reaction, atoms bumping into atom to transmit an effect over space. When modern physics, however, examined the atoms very close range, it discovered that the atom evaporates. It appears to be more like energy. We think of an atom like a thing, but it's really more like an event. It further appears that atom events can have an instantaneous connection with one another as if there were no time or space between them. This seemingly impossible connection also holds for the mind that observes them. Atomic energy is so strange it even responds to the consciousness of the observer. The conclusion is that mind and matter make an indivisible unitary whole. Think about that. Mind and matter are one, single, indivisible dance of energy. Casey's term for what modern science is coming to accept is oneness. There is one spirit or energy that unites all of creation. It permits and permeates everything. It unites all the atoms of the universe. It connects all human beings with one another and with everything else in creation. Although we may appear to one another as separate, disconnected beings, we are each extensions of the Creator Spirit. What happens to one of us touches us all. There is a unified psychic ecology among all events in creation. Casey explained that God created human souls out of the Creator's own being. Each soul is a projection of God, in the same way that our thoughts and images are projections of our mind. Although each soul has its individuality, all souls are of one spirit. Moreover, each soul reflects the whole of creation. Each soul is a miniature universe, a model of the larger universe. Casey likened the soul to a drop of water from the ocean. The drop is a miniature ocean with all the ingredients of that ocean. Within each person, therefore, is intimate knowledge of all creation. Casey's statement that each of us is a miniature model of the universe is a restatement of an ancient mystical teaching. It's also becoming a recurrent theme in the new science. The modern jargon states that creation is holonomic, a term based upon the properties of the laser hologram. It has become a way of thinking about the unity of life. You'll find it discussed in most of the New Age science books. The development of laser holography has made unity concepts such as Casey's teachings concerning oneness more vital and exciting. 
while less philosophical or mythical. Unity is real, even if still hard to grasp or believe. When you aim a laser beam at a holographic plate, the beam bounces off the plate and projects a three-dimensional picture into space. You can walk about the picture and see the object from all sides. It looks solid and real. The holonomic property of the holograph becomes evident when you take the plate and break it into many small pieces. Even the smallest piece will still recreate the entire three-dimensional pictures in space. In some mysterious fashion, every tiny piece of the holographic plate contains the entire picture. In Casey's language, a soul is a piece of the complete holograph we call creation or God. Each soul has knowledge of the whole. That's why Casey explained being psychic is an inherent natural attribute of the soul. Intuition draws upon the universal knowledge that is psychically available to the soul, the superconscious mind. Obviously, from this description of the soul, our minds must be more than what appears to consciousness. In Casey's model of the mind, the conscious mind is the lower form of mind. It has the sharp sensory focus for detail, like a mouse, but lacks the far-seeing vision of the eagle. The mind does have its eagle, though. It's not the conscious mind, but Casey calls the superconscious mind. Casey once had a dream where he saw the mind pictured as a funnel. Its open end descended from infinity and stretched down to form a little mind. The little mind is the conscious mind, what a soul uses to focus on a physical reality. In other instances, he envisioned the mind as a multi-pointed star, each arm of the star being a funnel, growing out of the universal mind to become the tip of a soul's conscious mind. Casey's vision of the mind has some startling features. First, there is only one mind. This single living reality is a universal mind that we all have in common. It's a hard concept to grasp. The modern terminology calls the mind transpersonal. That means that except for your conscious mind, mind is not a personal thing, but something shared by all. Mind is like the air we share. Although we have our separate lungs to touch that air, there's only one air. Second, this mind remembers everything. Casey referred to this aspect of the mind as the Akashic Record or the Hall of Records. Everything that humanity has ever experienced is imprinted on the Akashic Record. Third, between the level of the universal mind and the individual conscious mind lies the region of the subconscious mind. We each have our own portion of the subconscious mind, but there are no boundaries in the regions of the subconscious mind. All subconscious minds of both the living and the dead are in contact with one another, We'll learn more about the implications of that startling fact. Fourth, as important as it is for dealing with the world, the conscious mind is only the very tip of the whole mind. It's highly focused and specializes in sensations concerning the physical world. The conscious mind has a very sharp boundary around itself. Through the conscious mind, each of us appears distinctly separate from one another. Finally, these different levels of the mind each provide their own channels of information. The conscious mind is a channel of sensory information. It gets its knowledge from outside the person. The subconscious mind is a channel of telepathic information. It gets its information from other people's thoughts and experiences. The superconscious mind is a channel of clairvoyance or universal knowledge. It gets its information directly from the oneness of all life. Intuition is a super channel, taking advantage of information coming through all the other channels. When intuition uses the imagination as its vehicle of expression, it will speak through visions and symbolic impressions. When it uses feelings and the emotions, it will speak through urges or promptings. When it uses thoughts, it may speak through a voice that we hear inside us. As we explore ways we can channel psychic information, inspiration, wisdom, and guidance, we'll refer to this basic vision of the mind. From these basic premises about the mind, Casey has provided a way for us to understand what can be both intriguing as well as confusing about the channeling phenomena. Developing intuition, for most of us, our intuitive experiences have come unbidden. They have been unexpected and spontaneous. Casey encourages us, however, to learn to develop our intuitive capacity. To do so, he would suggest we remember these major principles. 1. Intuition exists 
through our essential oneness with creation. As you become consciously one with life, you become more consciously intuitive. 2. Intuition arises from our sympathetic attunement with the object of our intuition. Empathy is a form of attunement. Love is the highest form of attunement. 3. A need to know something, usually for protection or guidance, stimulates intuition. Intuitive knowledge comes from within. Look within for intuition. 5. Intuition requires an acceptance of what spontaneously comes from within. It's usually our very first thought, feeling, or image. Genuine intuitions are consistent with our highest values or ideals. The best way to honor our intuition is to act on them. Casey bases his approach to developing intuition upon this sequence, need, attunement, and application. Intuitions come to guide us. There needs to be something we can do with the information for intuition to deliver it. Putting the intuitive information into service, applying it, is an important part of the process of developing intuitive awareness. Imagine that your channel of intuition is like a lightning rod. The lightning up in the sky is the infinite intelligence, the energy that seeks expression when it's needed. You want to bring the lightning down from the sky. If you don't provide a ground, however, a connection with the earth, the lightning won't come down your channel. Being prepared to put intuitions into service provides the necessary grounding. Spend time in nature. Casey often suggested that to begin to develop intuition, spend time in nature. It's an excellent method for cultivating the experience of oneness with life. Nature has a time-honored history of elevating people's consciousness to an awareness of God and of their relationship to all life. In surveys of spontaneous religious experiences, nature ranks as the number one temple where such revelations occur. In her book, Ecstasy, Marganita Lasky provides many examples of personal accounts of personal experiences and special experiences introduced by nature. In one case, a young woman in a state of deep depression pulled off the road to rest at a picnic site. When she got out of her car, a blue jay flew down right in front of her. With its insistent calls, it got her attention. When the woman noticed it, the blue jay started hopping away, stopping, looking back as if it wanted the woman to follow. She did, and she followed the bird quite a way into a clearing that revealed a beautiful view of Mount Hood. The sight of the snow-covered mountain struck a chord with the woman, and she felt somehow comforted. She broke into tears, and soon she had flushed her depression out of her system. Then she heard the blue jay calling again. Once again, she followed the bird. It led her back to her car. She drove away a different woman. This woman's story reflects one of these old phrases describing intuition, a little bird told me. Birds are a common symbol of telepathic and intuitive messages. Birds are expressive of the soul's spirit. In the Bible, the Holy Spirit appears as a dove. In pictures of other religion symbolism, they often sit on top of a tree, the place of superconscious awareness. The symbolism of birds is but one of the many examples of humanity's intuitive awareness of the channels of communication between nature and human beings. Ron Carey is the channel of the starseed transmissions and return of the bird tribes. He tells an interesting story how he became a channel for this inspirational source of intelligence. He moved his family out to live in nature for seven years while living in harmony with the elements. With no television or newspapers for distraction, Carey became more sensitive to nature's vibrations. His intuitive resonance with nature grew into communion with higher levels of intelligence. Waves of knowing came over him, and he allowed his those feelings to blossom spontaneously into words. He thus became a channel of what he calls intuitively received transmissions. Intuition is empathy. The description of Ron Carey's experience contains some of the words expressive of Casey's concept of oneness, harmony, resonance, and communion. Casey taught that intuition as well as psychic ability operates through such expressions of oneness. Intuition is not knowing through the senses or analysis, but through the sympathetic vibrations of empathy. The word Casey most often used was attunement. When we attune to something, we become one with it. 
Through an infinity of sympathetic vibrations, we resonate with the knowledge we wish to obtain. The knowledge becomes us. What is an intuitive understanding of a rose? You can look at the rose, observe its parts, and analyze them. That will give you an objective understanding. If you meditate on the rose, you can empathetically merge with it to become a rose yourself. You will begin to feel as the rose feels from within yourself. Imagery will arise that expresses your affinity with the rose. Thus, you will come to know the rose intuitively. Questions also have their own vibrations and contain the seeds of their own answers. You too will learn that when you pose a question to yourself, you can become aware of an answer that intuitively presents itself from within. As Casey reminds us, ask and you will receive. Develop asking into the art of attunement, of empathy with your core being, and you'll learn that the answer is a spontaneous response that happens within. Hearing voices. Socrates, the ancient Greek philosopher, had a voice that spoke to him. He called it his daemon, a divine voice. He noted that it never told him what to do, but often warned him against doing something that he was about to do. He learned to pay attention to its warnings. Intuitions often come as feelings, sometimes they come as voices. Among her documented cases, Dr. Bartlett tells of a woman who heard such a voice. She was driving a car when she heard a loud male voice yell in her ear, Stop! She was so startled she slammed on the brakes. She found herself at an intersection. Although the light was green for her, just then a car running a red light sped across her path. Pat Rotergast is a channel for a source that calls itself Emmanuel. She describes the experience as somewhat like intuition and inner knowing. She remains in a normal state of consciousness. She turns within and she hears the voice of Emmanuel speaking. Hearing voices sounds like something that happens to the mentally ill. It's true that some people do suffer from psychological disorders that involve hearing voices. Hearing voices, however, doesn't necessarily mean a mental disturbance. We might say there are good voices and bad voices. In his book, The Natural Depth in Man, Wilson Van Dusen shared his experience counseling people in mental hospitals who suffered from hearing voices. These people reported hearing different voices, voices that spoke with different tones and spoke different things. There were voices that were highly critical and said terrible things. He coached the person to speak back to those voices to tell them to stop. They also heard voices that spoke kind of words and had encouraging things to say. He helped the person to learn how to listen to those voices. These inner helpers could offer advice about the person's recovery. As mental health returned, the bad voices went away, but the good voices remained as helpers and guides. Hearing voices can be a symptom of madness or a channel of intuition. Casey indicated that a person who hears voices may be closer to the universal than the person who stands by to comment. Yet through imbalances, the voices are not helpful. Exploring the range of channels available to us puts us at a risk. We can gain from learning to become active channels, but we'll also confront dangers as well. Here's what Casey's perspective proves to be quite helpful. He teaches us to anchor our channeling in ideals and purposes. We will learn that by basing our explorations upon a standard of excellence, an ideal, we direct the receptivity of our channel. By having some purpose focused on serving a real need, we direct the active part of our channel in a constructive manner. We'll learn that the subconscious mind is like a strong cross current that we have to swim through as we reach upward to the superconscious mind. Whenever dealing with the subconscious mind, be prepared for both. Good news and bad news, ideals and purposes help us filter what the cross currents of the subconscious bring us. They also help us to reach the superconscious mind of our higher self. Our ideals help us to attune to the highest source of guidance learning to listen to the still small voice. When the society of friends gather for their religious service, they sit in silence. There is no one singled out as the minister who delivers a sermon. Instead, all meditate and wait upon the still small voice within. As a person feels prompted by that voice, that person speaks it aloud. Sitting together, sharing with one another messages from the still voice from within. The Quakers find the spiritual communion they value. Casey gave us a way to introduce ourselves to the still small voice within, 
a term he identified with intuition. Casey's method is learning by doing, making practical use of intuition even as we learn to recognize its voice. You'll learn how to enlist the aid of intuition in making decisions while learning how you personally experience intuition operating within you. Begin with the difficult decision you have to make. Think through the alternatives, consider your values and purposes, and make your best decision. Make a tentative commitment to follow through on that decision. Making that commitment is necessary to arouse your entire being in the contemplation of that decision. Hypothetical thoughts don't excite the intuitive faculty, for it's of a more practical bent. Casey suggests that next, you sit down and get as quiet as possible within yourself. This step is the attunement. Focus on the feelings evoked by your highest values and your ideals. When you are in the frame of mind that is resonating with your ideals, ask yourself if your decision is a good one. There will be a response to that question within you, a yes or a no. That response is the voice of intuition. You may experience it as a voice or as a feeling or as a thought. An answer will be there. It's usually the very first thing that comes to mind. Learning to trust intuition. Accepting the first thing that comes to mind is often one of the hardest aspects of learning intuition. It involves trust. It involves acceptance of one's natural spontaneous impulses. Most of us have trouble with that level of trust and self-acceptance. One of the reasons working with intuition pays spiritual dividends is that it forces you to work on the issue of self-trust. It requires you to make contact with that part of you that is trustworthy. Suppose I have a question that I need answered. I try to notice what's the first thought that comes to my mind. That will be the intuitive answer. I find, however, that I can't even tell what the first thing is. As soon as anything comes into mind, I react to it. I evaluate it and I judge it. I do that so fast, I can't even find the original thought anymore. Those evaluations and reactions are the functioning of the logical, rational mind. They jump on and modify the intuitive response so quickly, it's hard to catch the intuition in its raw form. Part of learning to trust intuition is learning to accept your first response and save the evaluation for later. One way to learn to identify your first spontaneous response is that it is unpredictable. That's what makes it individual, unique to you, and special. Your other responses are much more of a habitual nature. They are more predictable. Unlike intuition, the voice of conscience can be predictable. If you're not surprised when your conscience bothers you, it's not likely to be your intuitive conscience. When your conscience surprises you with its interjected remark, it's more likely to be the intuitive dimension to your conscience and not simply habits of evaluation. The intuitive conscience is like a loving friend because rather than simply criticize or condemn you, it sees your underlying motives and helps you face yourself. So you better pay attention. The guardian angel. Intuition guides us and guards us. It inspires us. It brings us experiences of spiritual meaning. Sometimes it speaks to us as an inner voice. Sometimes it creates feelings or desires within us. Sometimes it simply nudges us and guides us without our awareness. Its promptings are both subtle and loud. It's one face of the higher self. Intuition performs all the services we might expect of the guardian angel. Casey indicated, in fact, that within each of us is a guardian angel. Casey explained that our guardian angel resides where our portion of the superconscious mind becomes the one universal mind. Casey described the guardian angel as that part of us that hasn't forgotten our oneness with God and knows of no separation from God. The guardian angel thus has no free will of its own but serves only the will of God. The actions of our intuition aren't the response of our free will. They are involuntary, spontaneous responses of our guardian angel, drawing us ever closer to the experience of oneness. Our guardian angel, part of ourselves, is one of the images we can have for the term our higher self. By day, when we are awake, we experience our guardian angel through intuition. By night, when we sleep, Casey indicates that we drop the consciousness of separation and attune more to the consciousness natural to the guardian angel state. 
In sleep, we become pure intuition. Out of that state of consciousness, we give birth to dreams, a nightly channel of the higher self. So it's wonderful to talk about intuition. And I've had several episodes where I've talked about it. We've talked about it with Florence Scovel Shin. We have talked about following our hunches. I have one of the original episodes of this was intuition. There is a section in my book, The Reality Revolution, that talks about intuition. It's a fundamental and important part. The transurfing model is fascinating in that when bad things happen in a train accident, then you're aware of that other version of yourself having an accident, and that's the intuition. So I believe that following the intuition gives us access to the available time streams around us and to our inner guidance and the guardian angel as discussed here. So I have found this particular discussion very interesting because I always believe Edgar Cayce had connected to something more divine from within. And the attunement is what I believe in. I believe in an attunement and attunement is part of the process of finding your intuition but listen to your hunches and those hunches that you have can really help you to change your life and edgar casey really gave us an outline of that with his many different teachings i'd love to get your impressions on intuition and your guardian angels and how you followed them and let everybody know in the comments other people might be struggling with following their intuition and your stories might help them please be sure to put a like on this video so we enter into the algorithm and other people can learn about intuition from this unique perspective in any case thank you so much for joining me and i'm sending out love to everyone all episodes of The Reality Revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution.